You know what I'm talking about? And the drama. Maybe there's one question you won't answer. And well, comes. yeah, I mean, I, I, yes, I'm an expert on the universe, and I, I, I have a feeling for what is more interesting about the universe to share with others th compared with other bits of information. I was asked in that video that yeah. has more than six million views, exactly. more, slightly more than a cat falling off a counter, Much more. Was, was the question was, what is the most astonishing fact that I know about the universe? And that was a mild interview with Time Magazine in my office, and there it languished until a creative videographer put gorgeous imagery on my words. And so people are not there to hear me, they're here to sell, they watch that video to celebrate the universe. And that most astonishing fact was recognizing that the atoms in our body are traceable to stars that had manufactured them in their core, exploded, scattering this enrichment across the galaxy, influencing the gas clouds yet to form a next generation of stars, then planets, then life. So that not only are, are we in the universe, the universe is in us. And I, that's a profound gift that 20th century astrophysics has given humanity because it creates a connectivity to us all. So much of what we do as humans is tribalistic. Are you in this club? Are you in this state? Are you in this country? Are you have a different skin color, religion, political leaning? We go out of our way to divide, and one of the greatest messages of cosmos, one of the greatest messages of a cosmic perspective is the awareness of the connectivity of us all. And four in 10 Americans still believe in creationism. So scientific literacy, we could say, is fairly low right now. What do you think, what do you think contributes to that? What's the single biggest thing? Or, and how will Cosmos change that? Yeah, I think it's, it's easy for a modern population to take the fruits of science for granted. You know, you have people saying, I don't like science, and science is this, and that, while they're on their cell phone talking to you. <coughs> so, or I don't like space, you know, uh, meanwhile they're looking at a map of the hurricane that's ready to, <laughs> from, taken from a satellite. That, so, so, I worry that if science doesn't keep progressing in the profound leaps that it, took, for example, in the 1960s. We're going to the moon. There's a space frontier being breached. Back in the 1960s, everyone was thinking about, yes, there was a turbulent decade, especially in America, uh, as turbulent a decade as we've experienced since the Civil War. No doubt about it. But in there, surrounding that, were people dreaming of a future. It was reflected in our literature, in our movies, in our the, the hopefulness of, 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 of of TV series like Star Trek, the, the, the future thinking that went into the World's Fair. Uh, in New, just, just, and by the way, people knew that that future was, would be brought to you by innovations in science and technology. And as long as you saw those innovations manifest daily in headlines, big innovations, then you say, hey, science is, I'm, I'm good with that. The moment that stagnates, and you start taking the technologies for granted, you start thinking it has nothing to do with your culture or your civilization. And so I don't blame people for drifting. I blame the absence of vision that would have kept science moving forward so that everyone would continue to look up instead of down. Yeah, I mean, yeah I mean, there are a lot of drivers of innovation. Uh, one of them is war, it's been that forever. Uh, we went to the moon not because, in spite of John Kennedy's speech, mm -hmm. where he says, we choose to go to the moon not because it's easy, but because it's hard. And, and he's got this stirring rhetoric, and you say, wow, we're, we're explorers, we're human, it's in our DNA. But in that same speech, it was, we need to show the communists that we have the better way of government. I mean, it's basically in that speech. That was the war driver. Right. And so, so I don't want to do go into space for war, but there are other reasons to do it. Um, I, I'm going to repeat. Uh, I, uh, uh, Diamandis's famous quote, he says the first, is he here in the audience? He was in the, uh, uh, Peter Diamandis, the, f the first trillionaire ever is going to be the person who mines the asteroids. P practically boundless, unlimited sources of, re uh, of, of resources. And, and I, I joke about this occasionally in my Twitter stream, if an alien shows up right here, I would be embarrassed to tell them that we still get energy from fossil fuels after we fight wars by ex extracting it from under someone's house. And, and they would be laughing at me, saying, ha, don't you realize there's unlimited sources of energy in the universe? And I say, sorry, you know, come back in maybe 10 years. So I'd like to think Cosmos, 
we'll, or, or 50 years at the rate we're going, uh, that Cosmos would sensitize people to the power of innovations in science and technology to transform so much of what are today's problems where people say, I got problems, I, let me solve them here on Earth before I look up in the universe. That's like, say, that's like saying, uh, look at that hill and mountain and valley, I want to go explore. No, we have problems here in the cave we need to solve first before you go anywhere. No, that's not how exploration works and that's not how our species, that's not how our civilization has advanced over the millennia. Progress no, or pushing no, because uh, people, they don't want to die, so that, ah, that drives okay. war drive. That's the war driver. war driver. But you don't want to die poor, okay? <laughs> so, so you'll do things if it can generate wealth. And generally what comes with wealth is also health. Right. So you can use economic ah. drivers for all of this. And the greatest, the greatest achievements our species have ever expressed has come about either from war driver or e economic drivers. You list, list the, I mean, the most expensive things we've ever done have been in the interest of those two activities. So the Manhattan Project, that was war, and Apollo Project, war. The, the Great Wall of China, war. But, but the Columbus voyages, that was a search for wealth, a search for, uh, there's a tandem list of things we've done for the generation of wealth. And no one is in this organization without a detailed, sensitive understanding of the value of that. And so I see space as a frontier that taps all the STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math. We're looking for life, I need the biologist. In soils, I need the geologist. In the space, I need the astrophysicist. With structures, I need the, the engineers. Those are the frontiers that get us up in the morning and say, I want to do that. What, what, what do you say to the eighth grader? You stand in front of them and say, who wants to be an aerospace engineer so that you can uh, design an airplane 20% more fuel efficient than the one your father flew. I, I, I don't know that that works. No. But if I stand there and say, who wants to be an aerospace engineer? You can design an airplane to navigate the rarefied atmosphere of Mars because that's where we're going next. I got them all. I win that. I win that. Approaches that would work, or what would you suggest to make science education? Yeah, that's better? a great question. I don't. I don't have an easy answer for that. But I have some thoughts. And my thoughts are, you know, we've all been to a mall. Those Americans in the audience, you know what I'm about to describe. There's a parent and a child, 10-year-old child, and the parent says, oh, come over here, Timmy or, or Mary. And the kid says, no, I don't want it. I want a toy. I want this. And this is like, that's just an American family, right? And you go to the Far East, and there's so much more respect accorded between generations. And some of that is cultural. Some might even be religious. but. And I wonder if the respect for previous generations interferes with a new thought you might have that would disagree or conflict with anything you've been told by people who came before you. If that's the case, then the irreverence of the youth in America are the actual seeds of innovation that comes later. But you'd still need to learn the math and the science to get somewhere. I think the effect you describe has delayed the collapse of American economy <laughs> longer than it might have otherwise take, right. uh, uh, taken. But uh, my high school, uh, I, I noted this, my high school, the Bronx High School of Science in New York City, has eight Nobel laureates among its graduates. That's the same number of Nobel laureates as the country of Spain. And so you can ask if Spain's had a troublesome 20th century with civil war and the like. So there are these forces operating, but Spain used to be at the front of exploration. That's why almost half the world speaks Spanish. They went around the world, all right? And somehow that stopped at some point. So your, your urge to go beyond whatever boundaries someone else set up for you is what takes you into the future. Without this, yeah, you can huddle and stay in the present, but then you don't invent a tomorrow. And you know the tomorrow I want? You know, when the asteroid comes, I don't want people to say, run! stockpile, <laughs> toilet paper, whatever it is you buy in the, in the store, because the, I, I, people will do that, but I want to be among people who say, the asteroid's coming? How do we deflect that? Here comes the hurricane, ready to level a city. How do we tap the cyclonic energy of that hurricane to drive the energy needs of the city that the hurricane might otherwise be leveling? That's the kind of people we need in society, because they invent a tomorrow.